We are looking today at what we're going to call doxological imagination. That is, the, what, are, what are the visions and images in our mind when we think of worship, particularly corporate worship, and what's going on in the worship gathering. We're going to think through a little bit about sort of the common movement in a worship gathering that's common to many churches, uh, whether it's explicit or implicit or even just intuited, and those movements are, uh, I'll just I'll walk through them, explain them, and then we'll kind of dive back into them later. The call or call to worship, confession of sin, uh, consecration, I, these are all C's so you can remember, consecration, which is basically the declaration of pardon or assurance of pardon. Communion would be communion with the Lord in His Word or the Lord's Supper and or the Lord's Supper. And then commission is the, the sending or the benediction, going back out with the Lord. Uh, and together this is often called gospel renewal worship. And again, this is explicit in many churches, like in your order of worship, they'll be here. Sometimes it's not here, but it's actually being followed. And a lot of churches just intuit that these are good things. And so we'll collect a lot of, of them. And so we'll, we'll keep that in mind and then talk about what is the, what is the heavenly realities going on around this? Uh, and how do, how do those heavenly realities energize and animate those so our own imagination, our own vision of doxology is expanded and rounded out a little bit. Uh, if I were to ask you, or if, if we were to ask a normal person in, in the churches, in your church, like, what's going on in worship? What do you do? You might hear things like, well, we pray, and we preach, and we sing, and we take communion. That's all good things. And if we were to ask, why is that special? Why is it important that we do that? We might say something like, well, it's the one time of week where we all get together and focus on these things, the brothers and sisters in Christ, and we can encourage each other. And that's true. And as good as all of those things are, and they are good before all those, uh, the Scripture invites us to a bigger vision than that. That there's more going on in worship than, than just these things. That there is a heavenly reality behind and in uh, which we are participating, that's participating with us. Uh, however, we, because of where we are in history and the, the stories we inhabit and inherit, maybe are particularly apt to screen out those heavenly realities, even if we don't intend to. I just want to make a little book recommendation. There's a book called Worship and the Reality of God by a theologian named John Jefferson Davis. Um, it's, encouraged. It's, not, it's not a long read. It's a, kind of a challenging read. It's about the reality of God and worship. And Davis in there talks about where we are in the 21st century and, and Christian tradition, three reasons we might sort of be inclined to screen out those heavenly realities. One is, if you are in the Reformation tradition, as good as that is, and we are for the Reformation tradition, of course, that's a tradition which, you know, was started in, in rightly seeing the abuses of what we call the Lord's Supper and transubstantiation in the Catholic Church. But it could well be that there was such a move against that, there was almost like what we call an overcorrection away from the presence of God in the sacraments at all. And so he calls it what we, we have a doctrine of real absence of God. Theologically, you know, spiritual presence of Christ is what we profess, but functionally he wonders if that tradition hasn't yielded a sense of real absence of God in the sacraments. Likewise, a focus on preaching, which we are all for, I'm, you know, we're for that, so focused on preaching that we kind of move away from a, the importance of the sacraments and what they do. And if you're being influenced by the Puritan tradition at all, you know, the Puritan tradition has been very apt to remove all decor out of your worship space. And removing pictures of angels and heavenly beings, maybe that has thinned out our vision of what's going on in corporate worship. That's one thing he mentions. He also mentions that we're all suffering from a hangover from the Enlightenment still, right? When supernatural realities are dismissed out of hand and if worship is seen as important, it's seen as important because it has some moral formation power to conform us to some virtues of the past that are good for culture and good for society. And finally, he suggests that if we're in the American tradition, that the Second Great Awakening revivalistic sort of environment in worship has functionally succeeded in removing our vision from Christ to the experience of the worshiper. And a lot of the... Uh, 
well, a lot of church leadership and worship leadership is how the people can experience worship better. That's fine. It's just not what the scripture says worship is about. Um, so one of the ways to uh, thicken that thinned out vision of of doxology and recapture doxological imagination is looking at passages like Hebrews 12. And that's what I want to look at a little bit today. So if you got your Bible, open up to Hebrews chapter 12. And as you're doing that, I want to remind you the context of the book of Hebrews in general. Hebrews is a book given to a gathered assembly. So originally it would have been read probably in a gathered, assembled worship gathering. And the theme of worship is rich through the book of Hebrews uh, with this major theme that Jesus is superior to angels, He's superior to the Old Testament priests, He's superior in the fulfillment of these Old Testament institutions, and that because of Him as this new mediator, superior mediator, we have access uh, to the throne of grace. We a- have access to a new and living way. It's like we get to come all the way in. We get to come all the way in in Jesus, where in the Old Testament that was seen from farther off. Hebrews 12 itself is a passage of encouragement and helping and encouraging the people to resist uh, growing discouraged of the trials that they're facing. It begins with him saying that even God in his God in his providence is even working in these trials. So, you know, lift your drooping hands, strengthen each other, encourage each other while holding on uh, to this better mediator, Jesus, in the gospel he delivers. And then finally, he warns them to resist the temptation to give up their birthright in Christ for the passing. Uh, pleasures of comfort in this world like Esau did, and it went badly for him. And, and then, culminating in this encouragement here, he presses on them the reality of what is going on as they worship in corporate worship. And, and really, it would have been even at the moment of reading this letter, as they were reading it the first time, if you think about the context there. And it, it begins by pointing them backwards. Remember when... God used Moses to bring the people out of slavery in Egypt. Remember back at Mount Sinai when God gave his people the law. So Hebrews 12, verse 18. For you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest, and to the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words make the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them. For they could not endure the order that was given, if even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. So Hebrews was written to Hebrews, right? Jewish Christians, and this would have been deep in their cultural memory, this event, when God brings them out of slavery and uh, at Mount Sinai gives them the law. It's in, you can read about it in Exodus 19. It's uh, republished in Deuteronomy 4. And let me just read, uh, here's the, the first hand of uh, uh, recording of this, Exodus 19, 16. On the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast, so that all the people in the camp trembled. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. The smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln, and the whole mountain trembled greatly. As, and as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him in thunder. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses up to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. So it's this very rich, visual, overwhelming the senses reality uh, where the voice of God is speaking, it's like thunder, uh, there is lightning, and there is smoke. And there is this trumpet blast that like, you know, splits your eardrums, angels, Mount Sinai was consecrated and holy so much that if an animal touched it, it was to die. And the people were like, we are terribly afraid of this. (laughs) How about Moses go up? God calls Moses up and here records Moses is even like, this is bothering me too. I know I'm the chosen mediator, but I am afraid of what's happening here. So even Moses was terrified. And he's beginning to remind them that this was a terrifying reality. 
But even in that, God provided for you through a mediator named Moses and offered a way for you to come in. But as we're going to see in this passage, there was a way in which Mount Sinai, as solid as it was, was in some ways insubstantial. Because it could be touched, it could be shaken. Because it can be shaken, it can be removed. And we're going to see at the end of this passage, it actually is removed or transformed in some way. And that behind that, there's something more substantial. There's something more permanent of which Sinai was a shadow. Something more powerful, more enduring, that cannot be shaken. And even though that's more real, it's not more threatening to God's people now, because there's another mediator, not Moses, but Jesus. So what is this thing? What is this more enduring, more substantial thing? Well, let's look at verse 22. Uh, Verse 22, but you have come, and actually, full stop, before we get to the thing, you have come. Okay? That is a present tense reality. Not you will come in the future. It's not a conditional thing. You might come. You could come if you have come to something. Like you've come to this class today. So I've come to this class today. You are here. We are participating in something together. There's a reality that we have come to together. So I just want to make a note of the present tense reality animating this worship thing. So there's a... There's a have come reality that's giving energy to whatever is happening in worship. Uh, So you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. Whoa. So this is, what is this? This is the place where God dwells, this, where Isaiah saw this vision in Isaiah 6, where these creatures surround the throne saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and who is and who is to come. And apparently they're saying this forever. This is what you've come to. Uh, and one of the features, one of the features in the book of Hebrews, one, it's the way it communicates Old Covenant and New Covenant realities is that of shadows. And then the Old Covenant, there were things that shadowed heavenly realities, shadowed down, not not foreshadowed, but there was a reality in the heavenlies that were shadowed down onto this earth. So Mount Sinai, for instance, could have been considered a shadow, or even Jerusalem, Mount Zion, a shadow of these heavenly realities. And so if you think about what that looks like, this light right now is shadowing my hand down onto this paper. And if you took your hand out right now, it would be shadowed down onto your Bible or your lap. And what you have in that shadow is something that is a real representation of the real thing that shows the form of it, but it's not nearly as substantial. Right? It's, uh, and it's not nearly as vibrant. It's a shadowed down reality. Sinai, Jerusalem, even the temple itself, as glorious as as it all is, is a shadowed down reality of something far more substantial, far more glorious, far far more vivacious with a lot more uh, power than what the shadow is. What is that? That's Mount Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem, the holy city of the living God. That's what's more substantial. And it's not just the city. It's not just the city. If if you know your your imagery from the book of Revelation, Revelation 21, that heavenly city comes down to earth and it touches down and it begins to restore everything. That heavenly city, signified by the presence of God, is described in Revelation 21 as a perfect cube. It's odd. What else in the Bible is signified by the presence of God and described as a perfect cube? Answer, the holy of holies in the temple. The very innermost, holiest place where God Himself met with His people. So what's being signified here is that you haven't just come to this, like, city, but you have come to the intimate, real presence of God as He is being worshipped in the heavenlies right now. So we could say, and look, this is is stretching our imagination, right? Doxological imagination. This is a challenge to us. Worship, according to the Bible, is what we might call a 
translocal experience. There's two localities, the, the earthly reality and the heavenly reality. And in worship, by the power of the Spirit, in a mysterious re- way, we are brought together. We are brought into the presence of this locality in heaven. Bringing us into the heavenlies. So we've come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering. So that, how many are innumerable. We don't know. I mean, it literally means you cannot n- number them, right? A lot. And they're in party clothes, apparently. Festal gathering, not a language we use, but it means they're ready to celebrate. Verse 23, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. Right? The gathering, the church of the firstborn. That's The firstborn is Jesus, right? This is a gathering of people that is created by this firstborn son, and we might say also that is a gathering of people who by virtue of their union with this firstborn son receive all the benefits and privileges of the firstborn son. They are there. And to God, the judge of all, right? This ultimate reality, the one who declares judgment based on his own character, he's there. This is where we're brought into. This is what we have come to. And to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, those who have gone before us and died in Christ from every tribe, tongue, language, and nation. They're there. And to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, the one through whom we have access and forgiveness. He's there. And to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Now, what is that? It's something we read and we just keep on reading, typically, I think. My sense of that is, the the blood of Abel spoke, and it spoke of the guilt of Cain. The blood cried out. The sprinkled blood cries out as well, but it cries out a better word. What's that word? Well, Cain's blood, or Abel's blood cried out guilty. Jesus' blood cries out free, or forgiven, or something. Grace is what it cries out. So, let's, uh, let's just think here. The, what we just read, how does this impact uh, what we're doing in worship? Uh, how does this bring, the, uh, how does our imagination made more, more robust? Well, you think about the call to worship. We're being called to worship. We're not trying to get people up so that we're not really trying to just get people in from the lobby, right, and get their kids set down, although functionally that's how what happens. But something is happening right here. It is going on already. Worship is happening in the heavenlies. We're calling people, hey, come in to what's happening here. You know, the, the, the angels are there. The saints are there. So when we're being called to worship, when we're calling somebody worship, we're not trying to get something to happen. We're calling people into something that is going on already. And we may sing a couple songs and, and whatever. I know these, these are all kind of made up in different orders, but... Uh, then we move into a time of confession. That might be corporate confession or private confession, uh, maybe both. A lot of churches have both. And why is that? Because God, the judge of all, (laughs) is there. The one who declares, this is right and this is wrong. And when we've been called to worship and seen him in his glory, what is obvious is we are sinful. And so we are called to confession, given an opportunity to to confess, because who's also there? There's a mediator there. Right? And so he's right present. And so we talk about this as gospel renewal and rehearsing this reality over and over again. So we confess our sin. And then this uh, consecration, which might be not the best word here, but it's a C word and you know, it's what <laughs> preachers do. Uh, this is the, the declaration of pardon, right? Why is that? Um, because there's, again, there's a mediator. But remember, there's this blood that cries out a better word than the blood of Abel. So that's it's and again, it's not just like, oh, it's nice that we're forgiven. We're not, there is something real going on here as we worship, based on a, a present reality of what we actually have come to. It goes on, verse 25. Oh, and by the way, when we do this in our church, this, uh, this freedom, at, at the end of our 
our declaration of pardon, we always respond with a congregation saying, in Christ we are forgiven, free, and restored. And it's, we do that every single week, and we've done it for years, because that is the, that is the completion of the, the mediatorial role of Jesus, and what the, that's actually what the sprinkled blood is calling out to. So that's the, there's a real reality that's happening as we're doing our declaration of pardon or assurance of pardon. Verse 25, see that you do not refuse him who is speaking. That's another present tense reality. Not like the one who spoke or the one who's going to talk to you someday. Like the one who spoke a long time ago and wrote it down and now we're thinking about it, reflecting on it and being inspired by it. That's as good as that is. He, he is speaking. So that's another present tense reality animating our worship. There is a speaking one. So I wanted to do this. Maybe this is what Hebrews 4 is anticipating when it said the Word of God is living and active. It's part of the reason the second Helvetic confession says the right preaching of the Word of God is the Word of God. Present, a speaking voice of God. So, in communion then, the, and this is not just the Lord's Supper, this is the Word of God, whether it's preached or tasted. I think about communion as tasting the Word of God. Why is that? Well, he's present, but he is speaking. Sorry about the sloppiness there. Now, this is why we encourage our people, prepare yourself to hear God in our worship, because he actively is communicating himself. Continues. For if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. That's another present tense, by the way. At that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, yet once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken, that is, things that have been made, in order, things have been made like Mount Sinai, like the Jerusalem temple, like the city of Jerusalem, in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. So, all of our worship is in view uh, of the temporary arrangement of our world that will one day be transformed by a shaking that comes when this holy city of which we are, we are part in worship touches down and renews all things. Therefore, verse 28, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. There's another, it's a present participle actually, but uh, we are receiving receiving a kingdom. So while we are doing all these things, that's not the first thing that's happening in worship. What's first happening is we have come, He is speaking, and we are receiving. All this is in response to these heavenly realities that are going on that in God's providence and by the power of the Spirit we connect with in this translocal reality in worship. Um, and thus, we, yeah, we might also say it's not just translocal, it's transtemporal. That, uh, because we are receiving a kingdom that it looks forward, like there's a, a full reception that's coming. But in worship, we are tasting that. Our eyes are being open to it. Our ears are being open to it. We are tasting that future in the present. And as we do that, by God's grace, it bolsters our hope and our understanding that we are part of that. And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. So, the last part is this commission. Uh, in, in some churches, be the, the sending or the benediction going back out. Why? Well, we're receiving, actively receiving. A kingdom that cannot be shaken. And our God is a consuming fire.
We're entering back into a story coming out of worship, guys, that cannot fail. It can't fail. We're receiving the kingdom that can't be shaken. And our God is a consuming fire. And now to us, that consuming fire is no longer terrifying. But it's a fire that bursts reverence and awe. Because Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, has taken our place and been consumed in our stead. And now all those who are part of the church of the firstborn sons, amen. That's why we're here. That's why you'll be here one day too. So that is the beginning, right? And the, the appropriate response to this is reverence and awe. And I don't know what you think about when there's reverence and awe in your life, but the angels think it's party time, right? So there's a, a wide range but we know that when we begin to let the Bible expand our doxological imagination, our doxological vision, then we, okay, then now we're starting to get a sense of what worship our Sunday morning gathering in a couple days for you guys will be. What's that's actually happening when you worship together. I hope you're edified by this window into ITS. Our goal of producing these videos is that you would be edified by the teaching coming from our professors. Secondly, also to highlight our professors and the way they teach in the classroom so you can see their biblical and theological fidelity. And then thirdly, you will surely have noticed from the chalkboard and the setup uh, that these are very reminiscent of the videos that R.C. Sproul used to make. So this is our way of giving a little homage to him, a mark of gratitude. We've learned much from him and in replicating his style, we're saying thank you to him uh, in that having learned from him, we wanna pass these things on to the next generation. If you'd like to learn more about Indianapolis Theological Seminary, please visit us online, indisem.org.